Hello, everyone. So I'm Dominic. And by now, you all know that so I'm one of the co-founders of IOTA. And I'm here to give you a rough introduction about myself, like, like five minutes about my background. And then later on, I'll talk a bit about how IOTA came to be and kind of our grand vision. Of, of where we want to be with IOD in 10 to 15 years. And so I already now want to apologize for all the profanity and the swearing that's going to happen. Because kind of when, when I give these talks, I always freestyle them and I just go with the flow and I usually swear a lot. And so I guess on YouTube, we can just like beep out those fucks and those whatever. Uh, and, and, and yeah, so, so, so let's jump into it. So, so a bit about my background. So, so I'm one of the way that I started my career is being a no life gamer. So, so I was one of those, those people back then who was, when, when, when I was a little kid, I was too bored with, with the beautiful nature of Sutirol. And so I was like, hey, I, I need to do something that's exciting. And so what I did back then is I actually started out with hacking computer games. So if all of you know Call of Duty, which is one of the most popular computer games, it has like 20 to 40 million players. If you've ever wondered what the, what the guy at the, at the top of the leaderboard looks like you, you have one here. Because I was actually the first in, in the leaderboard in Call of Duty back then when I was 14. And, and so it was, it's, it's kind of weird, like it's one of those humble brags, I think. And, and, and so this, this, this experience with, with, with hacking games and, and going like pushing the limits really like intrigued me. Because what they did back then is I didn't just hack the game, I also started selling the hacks. Because when I was trolling those online forums, I started getting contacted from, from other no-life gamers who, who like reached out to me like, hey man, can you give this to me as well? I was like, sure, why not? Give me 50 euros. <laughs> and, and, and so I created my PayPal account when I was 14. Don't ask me how I created it, because also you have to be 18 to create it. And, and so I created a PayPal account, and, and I started earning money with that. But after, after a certain point, I, I started realizing, hey, this is kind of boring. Because it's just the same thing over and over again. And so we just said, hey, like, I'm going to do something else. But what really intrigued me with, with this first experience of, 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 of like hacking games and selling those to other people is, is this entrepreneurship. Like, like truly building a product that, that solves a problem and that is needed and, and that people are willing to pay money for. And so with that experience, I actually started going on this quest, kind of this hustling, like figuring out what kind of product I should create to make money. Because at, 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 at the time, I really wanted to be independent. I wanted to make money so, so that I don't rely on anyone. And so what I started doing then is I actually started out with drop shipping on eBay. And, and so I used my sister's eBay account <laughs> to sell stuff and it was actually going quite well. So, so I had my own e-commerce store. I, had, I made some money when I was 15, it was like 20,000 euros back then. But eventually I got shut down. So, so my eBay account, or my sister's eBay account got banned. She wasn't too happy about that, honestly. But, but what I realized with that is that I needed to have an, a, a very reliable income stream. I shouldn't just be hustling, but I should focus on a single product. And, and that is why, why, why you start realizing, hey, I need to do my own startup. Because if I do my own startup, I can really build something that has a single feature, that focuses on, on offering a single product that people really want. Now, now before I actually got into doing my own startup, this whole Bitcoin and blockchain stuff happened to me. So it was 2011, and, and so I was on, on trolling on those online forums. And, and, and some friend just sent me the white paper of Bitcoin. I was like, hey, this is really interesting, even though I understood like 5% of it, because my English wasn't that good back then, it was 15. I was like, hey, this is really intriguing, because what really intrigued me with Bitcoin is, is this concept of having a completely new financial system. So no longer being reliant on, on PayPal, no longer being reliant on banks, but instead having this permissionless innovation where anyone is able to participate in, in these economic transactions and, and start creating value, like participating and contributing. Because obviously like my PayPal account got shut down, my eBay account got shut down, and I wasn't able to do anything. But now with this new technology, I was able to actually do stuff. Because like the main thing that really drove me into Bitcoin is because it enabled me to be an entrepreneur because now I can really start paying my people and can start accepting money. And so with that experience, I said, hey, like, I, I have to do a startup in this whole Bitcoin space. Now, the good thing is back then I had 10,000 euros of a an AWS credit, so Amazon Web Services, which is like a cloud service provider. And I think some of you know that, that in order to, to create a new currency in, in this blockchain, you have to put up some hashing power. And so with those 10,000 euros of, of, of AWS credits, I was able to mine Bitcoins. I was able to mine all alternative currencies as well. And so still, I still remember that day when, when I was in school and I was like, fuck, the, the price is increasing so much. I have to go. I, I was rushing down to, to the school library and I was like setting up new miners just to make more money. 
And, and so it turned out quite well. And, and so when it was 16, I had around 100K. So, so it was kind of a good start. And so I started realizing, hey, it's not just about this mining stuff, but it's really that, that this whole blockchain space is, 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 is a new ecosystem where you can start building your own startup. Where you can start really creating and contributing value back to the community. And so what I did back then is, is, is I, I was looking at the entire landscape and was figuring out like, where is there really a problem right now? And being the kind of naive kid I was, I was like thinking, hey, I'm going to make a Bitcoin exchange because like, like they make so much money. I was like, I can do that too, right? And, and, and so I, I, I came to an online forum where I then, through coincidence, was, was, was meeting up with, with my co-founder now, which is David Sunstable. So I was on this online forum, was like saying, hey, like, I have this idea and I'm looking for investors. So I have my own capital, but, but I need more money to actually do something with it. So, so David came to me and, say, and said, hey, look, let's do this together. Because he has contacts to, to those whales, which are like, like people who have a lot of cryptocurrencies. And, and so we came together, we started raising funds. It was, it, it, at one point, it was nearly half a million dollars. So, so I started realizing, hey, like, like, now it's about to get serious. Because now we're actually to build something and execute on it. And, and, and so I was looking in, in, at all of the problems that, I, that I'm currently facing. And the biggest problems was always like the regulatory stuff, the legal stuff, and the banking stuff, all of the hardcore stuff. And, and so what I did back then is through my contacts in, in this whole cryptocurrency space, I started knowing more about this crypto valley in Zug. So, so the crypto valley in Zug is, is, is in Switzerland. It's basically where we were trying to set up a self-regulating organization. We, we, we came to, to, the regulators, uh, to, to the regulators and said, hey, like, we want to be able to regulate ourselves because we know how the technology works, how it will be adopted, and the current challenges. So I went to Switzerland, but what ended up happening in Switzerland is kind of the re a re a reverse thing what you usually do. Because usually if you go to Switzerland, you, you end up saving tax money. I ended up going to Switzerland to lose all my money. And, and so that kind of sucked. Um, but, but, but I realized, hey, like, this is not the end. Like, this is just the beginning. Uh, like, it was my first failed startup. It was a lot of hardship. But, but the reason why, I'm, just, just as, a, as a point of why, why my startup failed is because it was kind of stupid, I was trusting the wrong people. And it was also like this whole cryptocurrency space had just like suddenly crashed. Because if, if, when, when I went into this space, I was thinking, hey, like, I have now all of this money and now I can start spending it all over this time frame. But suddenly the crash happened and I had nothing. And, and so I had to figure out what, what I'm actually going to do. And, and, and so me and David and kind of went on this quest to figure out what are we going to do next. Luckily, he and one of our current co-founders back then already had started another startup focused on, on creating new hardware, specifically for the Internet of Things. And we, back then, through this hardware, we actually started to realize, hey, if we truly want to build and enable this Internet of Things, we need to have a, a way for machines to actually pay each other because that is really the missing piece for, for the Internet of Things to take off. And, and now before I jump into how IOTA was actually created, I, I want to quickly mention what our vision with IOTA actually is. So, so, so our vision of, of the Internet of Things is, is this concept of fog computing, where you start processing the data locally instead of sending the data first to the cloud, the cloud processes the data, and then sends it back to those tiny IoT devices. Obviously, that stuff doesn't scale and, and it doesn't work. Instead, you need to be able to make the decisions locally. You need to process the data locally, and you also need to be able to share resources locally because you, you really want to make it possible for one machine that has access capacity, access resources, like for example, computational power, storage, or electricity, to be able to sell that to another machine which really needs this, 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 this uh, resource right now. And obviously, when it comes to the Internet of Things, those are deterministic machines. Those machines are not going to have a telco subscription service, right? But instead, they're going to pay on demand for the resource that they're going to utilize. And so what we started to realize, hey, this, this whole Internet of Things space, it really needs a micro payment protocol where you can pay per resource, where, where you're no longer reliant on, on transaction fees, and where you're no longer reliant on a trusted third party that can eventually shut you down. But instead, this whole Internet of Things and, and this whole fog computing environment is, needs a kind of permissionless innovation layer where, where, where anyone can start participating and start contributing to a whole new economy. And, and then we went on this quest to, to look at how we can actually achieve this vision of, of a machine economy where machines start trading with each other without any human involvement anymore. And obviously, because we've been in this blockchain space for so long, and we actually pioneered this space also by introducing some new fancy technologies, like, for example, the full proof of stake. We, we, we started realizing early on, like, hey, this, this whole blockchain space is so overhyped. Everyone is talking so much bullshit. 
throwing out all of these absurd claims, kind of like we can do this and that, even though it's not the reality. I start to realize, hey, this technology, when it comes to the Internet of Things, it, it's fundamentally flawed. And instead, we have to create a completely new architecture to actually enable this vision of, of a machine economy. And, and so the good thing is that the four founders of IOTA, so it's me, David Sensebe from Norway, and Sergei Popov from Brazil, and, and Sergei Vanceglo, AKA come from beyond, from Belarus. We had to do this versatile skill set because me and David, we, we, we were really into the tech stuff, but we also focused on, on, on the executing the vision and, and most important, the business side. And Sergei Popov was, was, was one of those really hardcore mathematicians. And Sergei Vanceglo is, is one of those, those computer science geniuses. And so it was perfect mix coming together. And, and so what we then did is, is we came up with a white paper. And obviously to, to execute this idea because, you know, like I lost all my money in Switzerland, we, we had to figure out a new way to actually build this protocol. And so what we did then is we, we did an ICO. So, so an ICO, I guess most of you probably know what an ICO is, an initial, an initial coin offering where you start raising money and you give in return, you give those, those tokens. And now right now, all of those ICOs are really absurd, like random teams raising $200 million. And, and so we were, we were the team that raised $500,000. And, and, and so that's nothing, right? But, but it's, it was still something and, and was sufficient for us to actually get started and, and build this protocol. And so with this 500K, we, we then went on this quest to actually build it and execute on it. And I can tell you, it was kind of a very difficult to, to be this underdog in this space because every time you were trying to push out something new and, and you were saying, hey, like we, we actually solve blockchain's problems, nobody was listening to you, right? It's, you can kind of compare this to, to, to screaming underwater because you, you have a protocol that actually solves problems that, that, that can truly change something, but nobody cares because everyone is too busy making money with, with Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever. And, and, and so over the years, we, we, we just simply realized, hey, like we, we need to focus on just the execution and not worry about anything else. And it's easier said than done, because obviously all of those other people, the, the, the main thing that, that kind of um, unsettled us is, is when we realized, hey, like all of those other people, they start making millions of dollars and we're kind of stuck in this loophole of, of, of trying to execute and trying to drive awareness. But, but we, we stayed cool, we didn't care that much. And, and we just, just continued executing on this vision of, of actually achieving and, and actually launching IOTA to the public. And so over the years, we, we, we started developing IOTA as, as, as a true protocol that is being utilized. So, 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 in, so we are not a team that actually hypes. So we are really pragmatic. We focus on executing, on, on, on actually do, getting shit done, right? And so what we did then is over the years, we, we, we started accumulating more and more business contacts through, through basically hustling, like just black uh, 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 cold mailing con uh, corporates and so on and so forth. And, and, and we started realizing, hey, like this technology is really demanded. Everyone kind of starts realizing it's, it's a slow progress, but people start getting aware of the, of, the, of the technology and just start realizing, hey, this is actually something that should be taken serious. And so even though it took quite a lot of time for people to get, this, get, get, to the, get to this point where they started realizing, hey, this is something serious, it was still worth it for us to, to get this early feedback because then we started realizing, hey, we are, on the right, we are on the right path to actually build something that has true potential to change the future. And, and, and so over the years, we, 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 we thought, first of all, we wanted to build a startup out of IOTA. But, but this whole vision of a machine economy, we started to realize, hey, if you truly want to achieve a, a new economy, you need to build a standard. You need to build something open source that anyone can utilize without someone benefiting from the ground layer. Because if, you, if, if, you for, if, if we, for example, had patented IOTA and, and charged royalty fees, I would argue that we would not be able to build this machine economy because then, then companies have to pay us and nobody gets the benefit out of it except for us. And so what we did then instead, we, we obviously open sourced everything. And, and what, we, what we are right now in the process of is actually building a nonprofit foundation in Germany. And so this nonprofit foundation in Germany is really focused on, on, on enabling this interoperability. So getting more corporates on board and making sure that those corporates actually utilize the protocol and that we actually standardize 